but other people like doing it differently. And for some types of questions, it is much more useful to try something with an inequality that is ever so slightly different. So, rule that off and write a little something for method two. What else am I going to start with? I'm about to do that. I'm about to do that. But in order to do that, you have to do some other stuff first with the assumption, which I'm about to show. Okay, so here comes method two. Now, I should point out, because we're proving the same result, you will find the algebra of what I do to be remarkably similar. Like I'm still going to be doing this sort of chopping and changing business, but the structure of the logic is kind of different. Um, and I'll point out afterwards what kind of scenarios you might want to choose this rather than the way that you already know. Okay? So let's begin actually with exactly the same assumption. Can you write that for me? I mean, it has to be this. This is the n equals k case. And this is where the similarities end. So what I'm going to do with this is this is a bit icky, right? So one of the things that we know about inequalities that we can take advantage of is if I rephrase this, if I put all the terms on the left of the inequality sign, right? What that leaves us, of course, with on the left hand, right hand side rather, is a zero. Okay? Now, you might think, well, what, what's the difference? Like you put them over there, put them over there. Does it make that big a deal? Well, it does if what you can get with over here, and when we do the k plus 1 case, if what you can do is prove that it's like, say, a square, for instance, because we know squares are positive, right? Uh, we know that they can be equal to 0 as well, but you can deal with that case separately if you like. And so if what you've got to deal with, like the guts of your proof, it makes it easier to just deal with something that's positive or negative, then this is a really good strategy to use. If I can prove it's greater than 0, I'll be done. So here's my assumption, because this is actually changed I'm going to name it, okay? Because I assumed something and then I sort of mucked about with it, so I'm going to give it a label, okay? Right, so now I return back to what I'm trying to do, which is my k plus one case. So I'm gonna um, prove true for n equals k plus one. Let's write that out, 12 to the k plus one. And again, because what I'm trying to do here is take advantage of, I know lots of things about positive numbers. I mean, I kind of did that in the previous proof, I just didn't make it as explicit. I'm going to rewrite this result, I'm going to rewrite this one, again with everything on the left-hand side. Okay, so I'm going to stick the 7 term over here, and the 5 term. Okay, so now these are the goalposts. They're ever so slightly moved, so I'm going after something different now. And as a consequence, I can structure my proof differently. Um, Nikita asked me about this a second ago. You, a second ago, usually we start off like any one of these proofs by taking your result and going with the left-hand side and then playing around with them. Now that I have the right-hand side as zero, I'm in a perfect position to do that. Okay? So instead of starting with the assumption, this is method two now, I'm going to start with the left-hand side of the result I'm trying to prove, which is all the pieces I needed. Now remember, two things. Number one, where you're headed. Number two, what tools you've got to get there. Where am I headed? What am I trying to get? I just want it to be positive. Just want it to be positive. If I can manipulate this thing into something positive, then, then I'm there, okay? That was the first thing, that's where I'm going. What tools do I have to use? If I've only got one, I just have this assumption, right? That's all I can really use, okay? So therefore, as we've seen before, do you remember with a series, right, if you've got k plus 1 terms, then you're going to write, you're going to write the second last one because you know you can use that, right? In other words, you're consciously writing the left-hand side of the result you're trying to prove in such a way that the inductive hypothesis just kind of appears, yeah? So what I'm going to do is I want to muck around with that <laughs> to try and find this. This is what I'm hunting for. If I can find that in there somewhere, 
I know that's positive because that was the assumption, right? So the question is, where is he? Okay. Now, you can see here again, and you'll see the parallels with my previous proof. Okay. I have 12 of these guys. I have 12 lots of 12 to the k. Okay. Now, I do not have 12 lots of these guys. Okay. But if I can rewrite this, do some adding and subtracting of the same term, or, or break apart these terms so that there is a 12, I can factorize and try and find this guy. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. Instead of writing minus 7 lots of 7 to k, because that's how many I actually have. In fact, I will, I will write this line just so my next line will be a little more obvious. Okay? I'm now going to say, well, what if I actually had minus 12 of them and not minus 7? Okay? Because then that'll be convenient for me, because then I can do some factorizing. Of course, I don't have minus 12, so what must I add to this to compensate so I'm still equal? Yeah, I've got to have five of them hanging out somewhere. Okay? So just like I did before with my red and my black, okay, these two terms here are equivalent to this term. Yep, you following? I'm going to do exactly the same thing with the 5 to the k terms. Uh, if I imagine that I had 12 of them, not 5, and say, OK, I'm going to write that. But now I need to compensate by adding something. What must I add? Seven. Is this feeling familiar? Yay. OK, so again, I've broken one term into two. This guy turned into this guy and this guy. So far, so good? OK, so now I can actually, the point of me putting 12s where there weren't 12s before is so I could factorize. Right? So this guy here is 12 to the k, 7 to the k, 5 to the k, look familiar, plus all of this trailing stuff. But the lovely thing about this line is that by my assumption, all of this is positive. Do you agree? Like it's 12 times some number that I've assumed to be positive, which is itself positive. Okay? So therefore, at this point, I can say, <clears throat> by my assumption, this is all positive, and this is all positive. So the whole thing must be positive, right? Now, be careful. I have to justify this, right? And there are two pieces, so I've got to refer to both of them. So I'm going to say, since, firstly, I think it's, it's, it is self-evident, just like we had before on my top line on that right-hand board, that this part is, there's nothing you can do to make that negative. So I'm going to write that. That guy is positive. So that's how I know this. What about this bit? How do I know this is positive? Well, By the assumption, which you'll notice I haven't invoked yet because now I'm doing it, right? Um, since that's positive and... Uh, oh, I don't need that. 12 to the k minus 7 to the k minus 5 to the k is positive by assumption. So you can see these proofs, despite how similar the algebra is, they are actually, um, one's the up, other one upside down, right? Here I started with the assumption, and here it only came in at the very last breath. So you can see I've got the left hand side is greater than zero, as required. That's what I was trying to get. That is the, that is the k plus one case. So, whoops, is easy. Um, I now have my last line, right? So, originally I asked you, or I said to you, I'm going to show you two methods. Now that you've seen two, and you don't have to tell me, I just want you to settle for yourself. Which do you like better? Um, which, one, which one fits in your brain? Which one sort of is more natural? Um, I think if I don't have uh, like something obvious jumping out at me, I think my brain defaults to this one. Okay, because most of the proofs that I do, you assume, you don't have to muck around with the assumption, and then you just go ahead and use it as much as you can. So I think my brain naturally goes here. However, as I mentioned, sometimes, sometimes what you get here, when you start with it, you're like, man, what do I do with this? I don't know where to go, right? In which case, maybe proving it's positive, maybe that will give you more traction and you can have a better go at the question, okay? Um, the algebra ends up being the same, which is why these are equivalent. I don't know which one's longer. What do you think? Second one. Second one. Probably, mm, second one. Yeah, I think the second one is marginally longer. Um, 
but not a huge amount. Like I think they're roughly equivalent. Um, I think, like I said, it's which one fits with your brain best, and if the question requires it, which one are you going to go towards? Okay. Um, a key thing: if you see squares in your result, that's a real signal to you. Hey, go for the positive one because every single square you find, you can already write that off and say, well, that's positive. So then I just worry about the rest of it. Okay.